A couple of big questions that we're going to answer on the exam room podcast today. Number one, when it comes to eating to improve diabetes, what is the best pattern of eating? And number two, how do you trust the quality of information that's being put out there? You know, we get bombarded by experts all over the place to say, eat this, not that, or eat that and not this. And that is always going to be the best way for you to tackle whatever your health challenges are. But when there are so many different opinions out there, how do we know how credible what it is the person is saying? Uh, uh, I'm, Hannah, I'm sorry. I'm going to take that again. No Forgive problem. Me. We're going to do take two. I got a little bit lost. I really liked it until I was like three quarters of the way through it. And then I was like, no, no problem. Hit the abort button. And I'm still thinking about the vegan dating game. I think that that's just, just brilliant. No pressure. I like where your head's at. All right. Take two. Here we go. We're going to answer two big questions here on the show today. Number one, when it comes to diabetes, what is the healthiest way to eat? How do you know the way that you're eating is the way to improve your blood sugar? But number two, when it comes to getting advice for how to eat the healthiest things to eat, the healthiest diets out there, how do you know the information that you're getting bombarded with is actually credible? Anytime you go on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you talk to your friends, your family, a random stranger on the street, everybody has an expert opinion. But how do you know that their expert opinion is actually factual? Where is that credibility coming from? How can we trust the sources of information that are telling us are, in fact, the healthiest route to take? Well, today we're answering both questions with somebody who would know because she has devoted her life to health. She has devoted her life to science. She has devoted her life to the facts. She is a friend of the show. She is the one and only Dr. Hanna Kaliova. Dr. K, thanks for being back on the program. Thanks for having me, Chuck. I'm, I'm so excited to be here today. I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm thrilled to get answers to everything. And I'm really thrilled that you've really answered both of those questions in this new recommendation that uh, you have teamed up with to advance over in Europe, what really is the recommended dietary pattern for somebody who is living with diabetes? Um, let's, number one, talk about these guidelines. Um, this is actually really big time stuff that you're doing uh, over in Europe. Let's talk about these guidelines and what it was that you you settled with here. I know that you've uh, presented some slides and we're going to get into some credibility, but just before we get into the nitty gritty of everything, basically speaking, if a person is really looking to take control of their insulin sensitivity, bring their blood sugar under control, what is the healthiest diet that they should be turning to? That's an important question, Chuck. Uh, and uh, we know from, um, you know, we've covered this topic uh, a few times already. Uh, and we know that for people with diabetes, relying on whole grains and legumes and fruits and vegetables um, is the best strategy to tackle their diabetes. Uh, now, many people find it confusing because these foods also happen to be high in carbohydrate and they've been educated to watch their carbohydrates. Uh, so it seems like something that goes against the, uh, you know, the mainstream. Uh, but I need to tell you, uh, this recommendation has actually become the mainstream and not only uh, like in the media, but also in the in the expert panel that I'm a part of, um, we put out some official recommendations that put these foods in the center of the of the plate. All right, now let's get into this because what you're saying here, uh, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of it, but we're going to show why also these recommendations now are becoming more and more widespread, more and more accepted in the mainstream, and in fact are the mainstream here. So I understand that you have put together some slides uh, for us to view. If you're watching this right now on YouTube or on Facebook, cool, you're going to see some really fantastic stuff. If you're listening to this podcast, don't worry, I've dropped a link to the interview for you in the show description. Nonetheless, you're about to learn a whole heap. So Dr. Kaliova, with that, I'm going to turn things over to you, set the stage for you to raise our health IQs with these recommendations and credibility. Let's get into it all. Thanks so much, Chuck. Let me share my slides with you. Can you see them? I got them. Wonderful. 
So evidence-based nutrition recommendations for diabetes. Why is it important? Why is it important to look for evidence? Um, well, many people, when they're diagnosed with diabetes, or their loved ones are diagnosed with diabetes, they're like, let me ask the expert, uh, which is a good start. But at the same time, it has its own challenges because it raises the question, who's the expert? <laughs> like, is it someone who has a PhD or is it a professor at a certain university? How do you define the expert? Is it someone who spent the last 30 years um, you know, treating patients and recommending a specific way of, of treatment. Uh, so we see that each one of us has a certain way and has certain blind spots also. So let's say uh, someone is keen on, a, on recommending people a keto diet. Uh, they may have a PhD, they may be a professor at a university, uh, but how do we balance that approach with other approaches that are out there? How do we, as a person who doesn't know much about diabetes and nutrition, uh, go into this jungle and make sense of all the recommendations that are out there by the experts? And that's exactly why we got together as the expert panel of the Diabetes and Nutrition Study Group of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, which is an international group of experts. And we just published the evidence-based European recommendations for the dietary management of diabetes. Now, these recommendations have been published in the journal Diabetologia, uh, which is one of the leading journals in diabetes care. And it's the official journal of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. Uh, this will actually be the cover of the June issue of Diabetologia. So uh, the, the summary of the recommendations are here. Now, the, the expert opinion is considered a low quality um, piece of information. While it may be helpful in the beginning if you've been diagnosed with diabetes or if you have someone in your family uh, to look, look up what's available out there, you need a higher level of evidence, especially when it comes to official recommendations. Uh, when we look at personal experience, let's, let's, see, let's, uh, let's say you hear from someone who had diabetes and who tried a plant-based diet and completely reverse their diabetes. That, that would be considered a higher level of evidence, uh, especially if you meet 10 people like that and they all have a positive experience with that diet. Uh, then we have cohort studies or observational studies where, uh, for example, you uh, let people fill out their questionnaire on what they're eating, how their diet looks like, and then you check in with them two years later and you look at their risk of developing diabetes uh, for the next 10 years, let's say. Uh, that would be an observational study. You, you're you not intending to change their diet at all. You're just observing. You're looking at does what they eat have any effect on their risk of developing diabetes? The challenge with these observational studies is that there may be other factors that play a role. Uh, let's say someone eats a lot of fruits and vegetables, but they also um, have a higher education, they, are, um, they have a higher socioeconomic status, um, and they don't smoke, they're more physically active. How do you exactly filter out all these other factors that play a role? That's why observational studies are considered lower evidence than randomized controlled trials. Uh, randomized controlled trials uh, take, let's say, people with diabetes, and they, they randomly assign them to different treatments. Uh, let's say one group will follow a low-fat vegan diet, and the other group will follow a portion-controlled diet that still counts carbohydrates. 
these are this is head to head comparison of two different approaches and uh, the randomized controlled trials just provide a higher level of evidence for the for the official recommendations and that's the type of trials that we've we've been conducting as uh, at the physicians committee for responsible medicine now there are multiple randomized clinical trials that have been conducted on diet and diabetes so the next step is to go through all the papers that have been published on that topic and conduct systematic reviews and meta-analyses and just uh, synthesize and collect all the evidence and bring it all together so that it makes sense to lay people. So this is the process of updating the guideline, the, the, the nutrition guidelines for people with diabetes. It took us a few years uh, as an expert panel, uh, we started this process by asking important questions. What do people need to know? They need to know uh, what sources of carbohydrate and protein and fat are best for them. They also need to know which foods are best for them. And they also need to know uh, which diets are best for them in terms of diabetes. So over um, more the, it took us more than five years to study all the papers, collect the evidence, grade the evidence using an objective tool that's called the grade, uh, and assess whether the evidence is high or low for, for each of the outcomes, uh, and then publish um, multiple papers, and then collect the evidence in one uh, recommendation paper. Now, the evidence using the grade system uh, ranges between high and very low based on our confidence, uh, whether it's a true effect that lies close to that of the estimate of the effect. Now, randomized clinical trials start as high with the evidence and observational studies start as low. And there can be upgrades or downgrades based on the quality of the study. So let's say we have a randomized clinical trial that has shown a beneficial effects of a plant-based diet that starts with a high certainty of evidence, but we also need to assess the risk of bias, the inconsistency, the indirectness and imprecision and publication bias. Uh, so the grade can be uh, upgraded or downgraded. So the level of evidence may be high or it may be downgraded uh, to moderate or even low or very low. Now, uh, over the last five years or so, our group has published 15 papers on different topics that you can look up and you can look for more detail. And we synthesized all the available evidence, and we published in we published it in one single paper. Now, what did we come up with? We we found out that there are certain foods that make diabetes better, like nothing else. Which are the foods? Well, these foods include vegetables and fruits whole grains, legumes, that's your beans and lentils and peas. And it's also nuts and seeds in moderate amount with uh, vegetable oils as sources of healthy fats. So these are the foods that people should consume the most of. But there are also foods people need to be really careful about and they should try to minimize them. And these include red and processed meat, the sodas, sources of sodium or high sodium foods such as cheese, for example, and refined grains. Uh, now, these are just simple, uh, simple guidelines that people can live by. Now, what is special about these dietary recommendations and why are they important? Number one is the comprehensive approach. We didn't cut the corners. We didn't rely on expert opinions. We didn't ask the fat 
uh, expert to write a paper and recommendations on what people should eat in terms of fat. Uh, but we did all the work. We researched all the literature that has been published on, on all the topics and published independent papers be before synthesizing them into one paper. That's number one. Number two, these dietary recommendations are official. They come from an official expert panel uh, of the Diabetes and Nutrition Study Group of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. Now, uh, if you're watching in the United States, you may be like, okay, well, that's for Europe, but what about the United States? What about the American Diabetes Association? Well, I've got some news for you. Uh, the European Association for the Study of Diabetes and the American Diabetes Association also meet on a regular basis and they publish joint uh, recommendations for people with diabetes um, time to time. So next time they meet, uh, it's likely that they will also update uh, the joint recommendations. Uh, and number three, why these dietary recommendations are so important is that they put all the plant-based foods in the center of the plate. Uh, they emphasize all the vegan foods that are that make diabetes much better and can actually reverse or even prevent diabetes. So eat your plants is the message from the official dietary recommendations for people with diabetes. And with that, uh, let me stop sharing my screen and... Uh, I bet you have many, many questions for me, Chuck. Oh, I've got one or two, Dr. Kaliova. Uh, very interesting, very interesting stuff. Um, before we get to the credibility portion, which very, very well done as far as how you weighted the particular research that was considered. Number one, um, the recommendations that you drew up here, um, even though we're waiting to see what movement will happen here in the U.S., how do they differ from the current U.S. dietary guidelines for somebody, uh, somebody with diabetes? The current recommendations for people with diabetes emphasize the energy restriction, restriction. That means someone who has been diagnosed with diabetes, they need to count their calories. They also need to watch their carbohydrates. That's the standard recommendation. And they state that a plant-based diet is possible, uh, but it's more uh, like on the side, uh, you know, like it's not in the center of the recommendation. Uh, now, this particular paper puts all the healthy plant foods in the center of the recommendations. Uh, and uh, that means that a vegan diet is just like like uh, the super food or the super diet for people with diabetes. And going to these recommendations as well, you were talking about the American Diabetes Association. One of the things that I know we grapple with here in the States is the impact that industry influence can have on dietary guidelines. In Europe, is there that same concern? Is it really easy for, say, uh, you know, the beef council to get in, whatever the equivalent would be in Europe, to get in there, throw a whole lot of money behind uh, the, really the policy makers, the policy shapers, the same way that they are able to do here in the States? Uh, you're raising an important uh, question, Chuck. Uh, and the industry funding seems to be omnipresent in the United States. And I need to say, and I'm really proud to be a part of this expert panel group because there has been no industry funding uh, involved in, in the dietary recommendation process uh, over the last few years. So that makes me really proud to be a member of, a, of such an independent group of, of experts um, who cannot, you know, compromise uh, their science based on any industry funding. And kind of with that in mind, what is the prevalence of diabetes in Europe compared to what we have right now in the States? Uh, the issues are kind of similar. 
uh, like the main objections of people, of clinicians, uh, you know, who would like to see their patients improve their diabetes. The objections usually include, well, a vegan diet, will people do it? <laughs> like it's such a major change to the, to the current diet that they're consuming. We're concerned that people will just not do it. Uh, and the answer is, uh, well, um, maybe each patient with diabetes should have the options. They should know, okay, this train will take me to my destination in two hours. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of slow and uh, the price is low. Uh, that means not many dietary changes are needed. Uh, hopefully it'll get me to my destination. But if, if it does, it'll be, it'll be really slow. And who knows if I'll get there. there there's another option that brings you to the destination real fast, but the price is also um, higher, such as when you take a fast train. I was recently in Japan and I loved the Shinkansen. The Shinkansen is the bullet train uh, that, that can go like 250 miles an hour. <laughs> and it's amazing. It takes you to your destination the trip that would usually take you two hours may take you only half an hour. But the price tag is also much higher. So you need to do the decision and make the decision yourself uh, based on your values. Uh, I always like the speed. If I can, you know, if I can gain uh, some, some advantage of getting somewhere faster, I consider it a major advantage. So if a vegan diet can improve your diabetes much faster and much more effectively, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to make the dietary changes? Uh, and that's a, that's a question that each, each person needs to answer for themselves individually. I hope to make it to Japan someday myself. Uh, that's really awesome that you're just there. Um, so when we're talking about making these changes and laying out the guidelines and people then weighing for themselves, you know, what route they want to take, how big of a reach are, are you expecting these particular recommendations to have? I mean, historically speaking, what has the reach been for the Diabetes and Nutrition Study Group and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes? Are they like the gold standard when it comes to nutrition for people with diabetes? That's exactly right, Chuck. They're the gold standard uh, and the official guidelines um, that, that, that were lastly published in 2004. So it's been a while, you know, it took us a while to update them. Uh, they've been cited by so many, so many papers and so many healthcare professionals. Uh, whenever healthcare professionals want to look up the official recommendations, uh, these guidelines come up as, as one of the first documents. So uh, they're the mainstream, um, they're influencing the healthcare professionals and also the lay audience, whoever wants, uh, whoever wants to learn more and uh, in more detail. What would the equivalent be of an organization here in the States? You mentioned the American Diabetes Association. Uh, would that be about the equivalent here? Or are we talking a like yes. full-blown FDA kind of deal? Uh, we're talking about the American Diabetes Association. All right. That's, that's big time right there. I mean, that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of things here. You mentioned that on your healthy uh, foods list, you you did include healthy fats. Now, mm -hmm. in the plant-based community, when you're talking about oils, I mean, that is a hot topic. I mean, you, a lot of people want to yeah. take those oils and light them right on fire and say, no, no, not in this yeah. kitchen. Um, nonetheless, you, you definitely had vegetable oil in your yes column. What data did you see that made you comfortable including that in the this is okay field? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Vegetable oils are a much better choice uh, than all the animal fats, such as butter or lard, let's say. Uh, so that led uh, to, um, th that led the expert panel 
to the conclusion that it's it's really good to emphasize the, the vegetable oils. And I need to say non-hydrogenated and non-tropical oils. So that excludes palm oil and it, it excludes uh, coconut oil. So uh, a good a good examples of the fats um, that that are recommended here are, for example, olive oil or, or rapeseed oil. Uh, and when we're talking about how much of these, uh, should we consume oils at all? Should we rely on nuts and seeds for the, uh, for the little fat that we need? That's an excellent question. And that regards the quantity, uh, but the source is the plant foods that contain these healthy fats. So that's number one. Number two, what about the quantity? Will someone with diabetes benefit from minimizing the oils as well? And the answer is absolutely yes. They will improve their insulin sensitivity and uh, it'll, their diabetes will improve much faster. They will also start losing weight more rapidly, which um, is one of the components that people with diabetes need help with. Um, so minimizing the oils is definitely good. Um, but in the first step, we need to know uh, that plant sources of fat are, are much better uh, than animal sources. All right. So let's kind of put a bow on that by saying vegetable oils are a better option right. if you already have diabetes if you're looking to lose weight the best option however may be to really then really restrict the amount that you're eating or potentially even go that super hardcore route and cut them out altogether is is that kind of what we're concluding here that's exactly right all right got you there um and just for those who um are unfamiliar we, we talked about plant oils and you even said well look like get the tropical oils out they're not really included in this conversation what are some other unhealthy oils that definitely raise that red flag for you uh yeah the the oils that are high in saturated fat include the tropical oils such as coconut oil and palm oil so they're out unfortunately these are uh, the the cheap fats that that are being used in in the industry. So when you look at packaged foods, when you look at the snacks, uh, many of them are just loaded with palm oil and coconut oil. So be aware of these and um, cut them out from your diet. They're not good for you. Uh, number two is also trans fats. Uh, those are also uh, super cheap fats. Uh, that are sometimes used for uh, for the snacks and for the processed foods. Um, their use has been limited, um, but they still have not been completely eliminated. So um, the tropical oils and the trans fats are the two kinds of fats that you really need to cut out from your diet completely. All right. Now let's bounce and talk about publication bias. This is something as a journalist that fascinates me. How did you <laughs> weight what the publication bias would be? So um, say that something was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Did that automatically carry more credibility with you all than say something that was, and this is a fictitious one, the International Journal of Plants, <laughs> right? Because you know that there's that inherent bias there. How did you guys weight that? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Chuck. Uh, just, to, just to give you an idea, uh, the grade system has a manual that's, you know, like a few hundred pages long, and it gives you all the detail, how to assess uh, everything. And it's also done uh, by a few people independently. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, a publication bias doesn't only refer to in which journal the, the study has been published, uh, but also uh, when, when a research group discovers something um, that sounds like it will be published and it will it will get some traction uh, those findings are more likely to be published by the authors than let's say like a 
neutral finding, let's say your hypothesis is that uh, rapeseed oil is excellent for diabetes and you do a study and you find out uh, that it was not so great as you expected. And in fact, um, you know, the opposite is true, let's say. Some research groups may completely, um, you know, put these findings aside and not publish them at all. So that's that's the publication bias. Like what uh, sounds trendy is more likely to be published than findings that kind of uh, doesn't sound that trendy at that moment to the to the particular research group. Did anybody say, well, now, wait a minute, though, Dr. Kaliova, I know that you love talking about a plant-based diet. I know that you work for the Physicians Committee, which is very much all about preventative nutrition and eating a plant-based diet. Did anybody ever try to poke holes in your credibility throughout this process? That's an excellent question, too, Chuck. In fact, I haven't been included only uh, in the work on plant-based diets but also on other dietary patterns. We assessed, uh, for example, the keto diets. We found out that, that keto diets are not good to be recommended to people with diabetes. So we discourage people from ketogenic diets in, in, this, in this official paper. Uh, we assessed also other kinds of dietary patterns, such as the Mediterranean diet or the Nordic diet, the DASH diet, uh, and I've been personally included in the process of assessing all of these dietary patterns. And how do you like check your own personal bias? Because mm -hmm. clearly, you know, you have arrived at a conclusion uh, that you believe is true to yourself. How do you like prevent your own personal bias from entering, you know, Dr. Kaliova work mode when you're assessing all of this data? That's an ex excellent question. And uh, each uh, each person, each member of the expert panel has their own personal bias. Uh, it's inevitable. Uh, but we also have a, a strict process by which uh, we need to abide and to which we adhere. Uh, and we just go step by step by assessing the evidence. And the fact that we work together as a team and let's say someone who, whose personal diet is a Nordic diet works with someone else who follows a Mediterranean diet and they also work together with someone who's vegan, that makes the team much stronger and much more independent and the outcome is much more unbiased. Have you ever gone into th something with, again, like your own personal bias? And, and clearly, as a professional, you're able to check that at the door. But your own personal bias perhaps gave you uh, your own personal hypothesis going mm -hmm. into something. But then when you saw research that was published that was counter to what your original hypothesis was, you then were able to still accept that research and those findings because they had been so locked down because clearly you have already uh, or also established a system for uh, being able to quantify uh, or rate how solid these findings could be. So have you ever been able to be swayed based off of some findings that you have also come across? Yeah, that's an important point. And I mean, again, having like a clear um, guidance and a clear process, how to grade the evidence is, is the key. Um, this being done by independent uh, members of the group is, is the key also. Uh, one example of, um, you know, one piece uh, where I'm a little bit like disappointed in the in the recommendations, we do recommend legumes, you know, your lentils and beans and, and peas uh, as, as a healthy, healthy group uh, or healthy foods that you should consume. Uh, but the evidence is graded as low. And uh, because there the, the, the beneficial effects of legumes have been assessed mainly by the observational data, not so much by the randomized clinical trials. Uh, so 
this is personally a bit disappointing to me uh, because I know from experience how legumes are super beneficial for people with diabetes. But at the same time, it reflects where we are, where the evidence is. It shows that we need more randomized clinical trials. Um, you know, we're not done. And this is, this is the two, uh, 2023 uh, dietary recommendation update, and we're not done. We need to continue the research to provide even stronger evidence for foods such as legumes. I guess my final question to you is because you feel passionately about the legumes. If you were to design mm -hmm. your own study specifically about this to try to get answers to the questions that are still outstanding there or just to shore up the quality of data, how would you, Dr. Kaliova, start to arrange this study? How would you organize it and lay it out? Yeah, an excellent study. Uh, like when we we're talking about legumes, your beans and lentils and peas, uh, an excellent study would be a randomized clinical trial where we would bring in people with type 2 diabetes and uh, we would give them uh, specific foods and ideally in a way where they wouldn't know uh, what they're consuming. So in some studies, in some nutritional studies, um, the research groups made different products, such as, for example, muffins or, you know, different kinds of products where they hid all the ingredients that needed to be there. With legumes, it's a bit more difficult, but ideally, um, you know, people would consume uh, different amounts of legumes and we would look at their glycemic control uh, and other markers of cardiometabolic health, their body weight, their blood pressure, uh, their A1C as a marker of glycemic control, their blood lipids. Uh, and so we would comprehensively uh, assess the effects of different uh, amounts of legumes that people consume over the course of, let's say, at least 12 weeks and, uh, you know, assess the effect on their diabetes and our other cardiometabolic outcomes. There it is. See, I look forward to you putting a study to, I'm not, I'm, I mean, let me just throw mm -hmm. this out there into the universe and see if we can't get it to manifest from the exam roomies. I would love for you to be front and center on a study like that. You design it, we'll implement it, We'll crowdfund it through the exam roomies and let's just get some beans on everybody's radar because my goodness gracious, I just think that that would be fantastic. Let's shore up that data and make sure that the next time that we do these rounds of uh, dietary recommendation updates, we, we, I mean, we really, I mean, we want that, that data rated as heavily as, as possible. We want that to have all the credibility in the world. And clearly, you know what you're doing when it comes to studies, because you have done so many of them that uh, the results on are just beyond reproach. They're so, so, so well done. So let's do those with beans and diabetes. What do you say, Dr. Kaliova? It's great to meet Chuck. All right. All right. And by the way, that's a uh, Hannah Kaliova, MD and PhD. So we're going to call Dr. Kaliova the double doc moving forward because <laughs> she's got doc doc on both, both bases. I mean, you, you're just literally one of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. And I so adore it every time you're on the show. It's so much fun for me because I always feel like we learn so much much. You take this so seriously and you love what you do and it shows and it is just a true joy to talk to you. So thanks for making the time today. Thanks so much, Chuck. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.